In this video, I'm going to be doodling another page from my upcoming tote theme coloring book. This doodle finds the little guys acting out all of their childhood pirate fantasies while going head to head with a mischievous kraken. I'll also be discussing why loving the journey that you're currently on in life can be far more fulfilling than even the final destination itself. Hey guys, Craig here. Hope everybody's doing well. Okay, so the topic of this speed doodle vlog is going to be on learning to love whatever journey you're on in life. So if you're ready, let's start doodling. I'm 54 years old, which based on my YouTube analytics means that I'm significantly older than most of you who are watching this video. Now even though I grew up in Canada with typical Western values, and even though it's only been about 45 years since I was a child, and 45 years really isn't that long ago if you think about it. I still grew up in a world that was drastically different from the world that we're living in today. And the one major factor that separates the world that I grew up in as a child from the world that kids are growing up in today is convenience. The term delayed gratification barely holds meaning in this day and age. And I truly believe that the level of convenience that the younger generation has come to expect as being the norm is one of the main factors that are preventing them from reaching their true potential in life. Now when I say that I grew up in a world that was vastly different, I mean it was different. Let me try and paint a mental picture for you of what the world was like when I was a kid. First of all, there was no such thing as the internet. In fact, home computers didn't even exist yet. And when I say home computers, I'm referring to any type of electronic computing device. Unless you were extremely well off, you didn't even own a calculator back in those days. I think we got our first digital calculator when I was around 10 years old, and you sure as hell weren't allowed to use them in school. There was no such thing as cell phones back then either. If you needed to make a phone call, you either used the phone that was mounted to the kitchen wall of your family home, or if you wanted a little privacy, you went down to the corner store and used the phone booth outside of the store for 10 cents. Considering there was no internet back then, obviously there were no streaming services either. Now you may be thinking, oh, so you had to rent movies from the video store instead of live streaming. <laughs> I wish. My childhood predates DVD players, VCRs, and even the Betamax. So there was no such thing as movie rental stores. If you wanted to see a movie, you had two options. You either had to go see it at your local movie theater, or if you were lucky, in the summer, you could go down to your local drive-in theater to watch it. And it wasn't like it is today, where a movie makes its debut in the theaters and then six months later shows up on television. Major motion pictures very rarely made the jump from theater to television. And the few that did took anywhere from five to seven years to do it. Most movies just played in a particular theater for a few months and then went away for a few years, only to be brought back as part of a double feature or as a re-release. I saw Star Wars in the theater in 1978 when it first came out. And then I saw it again in the theater two years later on in 1980, when it came back around just prior to the release of The Empire Strikes Back. And then I saw it again in the theater in 1983, when it was brought back around again just prior to the release of Return of the Jedi. And as for the movies we watched on television, well, they were all old. I'm talking 1940s to 1960s old. In fact, many of them were still in black and white. The point I'm trying to make is, if you wanted to see a particular movie, depending on whether it was a new or old movie, you would either have to wait for it to come to your local theater, or you would have to vigilantly scan the TV guide every week to make sure you didn't miss the one time that it was going to be playing on television over the next six months. And once you saw that it was coming to TV, you'd mark that date on your wall calendar to make sure that your butt was in front of that television at the precise time that that movie was going to be starting. Because remember, you couldn't pause or rewind the movie if you missed something. Now I'm sure there are a few of you young ones out there who are thinking, what the hell is a TV guide? The TV guide was the bible of the television fanatic. You could plan out your entire week's entertainment with this one little tiny book. And don't even get me started on the fall preview TV guide. You see, television stations would always bring in their new TV shows in September, just in time for the fall season and the Fall Preview TV Guide would give you an in-color preview of everything that was coming for the new season. This TV Guide was thick, and as a kid, that book was like Christmas in August, because it would list out all of the new cartoons that were coming to Saturday mornings. The most glorious time for kids from my generation. You see, television programming wasn't like it is today, 
you couldn't just watch cartoons anytime you wanted on a 24-hour cartoon network. There were certain slots of time dedicated to kids' programming, which was normally cartoons. The first slots occurred daily at 5 p.m. on Monday through Friday, right before the evening news. And that was the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour. Now, because the Looney Tune cartoons were actually created for adults with somewhat of an adult humor, your parents usually didn't mind watching them with you. So that was one hour of every day that as a child, you were able to immerse yourself into a cartoon world. Now, one hour isn't very long. 60 minutes of cartoons was not enough to satisfy the average kid's cartoon needs. But it was just long enough as a parent to keep your kid from losing his mind throughout the week. And that brings us to the second television spot allocated to kids' programming, Saturdays. All of my best childhood memories occurred on Saturday mornings. From 7 a.m. until 12 noon, the three major broadcast networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS in Canada, all played non-stop back-to-back cartoons for five hours straight. And they all played cartoons created by different animation studios. If I remember correctly, ABC was exclusive to Warner Brothers, which consisted of your classic Looney Tune cartoons. You know, characters like Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, and Porky Pig. Now, NBC was exclusive to Hanna-Barbera, which included Scooby-Doo, the Flintstones, the Jetsons, as well as the entire Laugh Olympics crowd, which encompassed the likes of Yogi Bear, Hong Kong Fooey, Grape Ape, and of course Speed Buggy, just to name a few. And the last network, CBS, was a Canadian station. And they played lesser-known cartoons like Rocket Robin Hood, as well as non-cartoon programming like The Hilarious House of Frankenstein, which was an awesome TV show. Whoever created that kid's television show obviously dropped a lot of acid in the 60s. So as a kid, Saturdays were a cartoon smorgasbord, and you could jump from channel to channel watching whatever you wanted. And then the final programming spot occurred at 7 p.m. on Sunday, and that was The Wonderful World of Disney. This spot usually featured major motion pictures created by Disney. Some of them were cartoons and some of them were live action, but all of the content was oriented towards kids. So you're probably thinking, what does any of this have to do with learning to love the journey? As I think back on my childhood, I realized that it wasn't actually the act of sitting in front of the television for five hours every Saturday morning, watching cartoons and scarfing down a huge bowl of Lucky Charms that I remember so fondly. It was actually the anticipation of that moment that has stayed with me to this very day. Don't get me wrong, watching all of my favorite cartoons for a few hours throughout the week was great, but it was the anticipation of being able to do that that got me through doing my chores as well as doing my homework, so that my mother would allow me to sit down and watch those cartoons. And just like most kids, chores and homework were two of my least favorite things to do as a child. And it was the anticipation of those cartoon moments that enabled me to push through and do something that I hated every day. And that anticipation only existed because of the delayed gratification of only being able to watch those cartoons at a particular time during the week. When I got home from school at 3.30, I knew that I only had an hour and a half to finish my homework before the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner hour started at 5. If those cartoons had been available on a streaming service like Netflix or on a DVD, I wouldn't have been in such a rush to do my homework. If I didn't finish my homework until 7 p.m., I could just watch the cartoons then. And that type of procrastination mentality starts you down a very dangerous path as an adult as it pertains to achieving your goals in life. And that fact became very apparent to me as I got older. As I became an adult, technology began to make my life a lot more convenient. And because I no longer had to wait for things, the delayed gratification was gone. And with it, so was the anticipation that had pushed me through all of my struggles as a child. So on a day-to-day basis, I began to make a lot of really unhealthy and counterproductive choices in my life. Sure, I could spend a half hour cooking a really healthy meal for myself after I got home from work each day. Or, I could save myself about 25 minutes and just run over to the Burger King drive through and get myself a hot meal ready to go. My destination in that situation was to fill my belly with food, and both choices got me to that destination. The healthy choice required me to take a much longer journey with the food preparation, whereas the unhealthy journey allowed me to arrive at my destination much, much faster. Now you may be thinking, yeah, but the unhealthy choice would have some very negative consequences on your health. Surely that must have motivated you. Not really, because I didn't see those effects right away. So out of sight, out of mind. So throughout my 20s and 30s, I chose the path of convenience when doing pretty much anything, 
And it wasn't until my mid-30s that I truly started to see the negative effects that those choices were having on my life. In my 20s, my weight was around 150 pounds. I had a decent amount of muscle on my frame and very little body fat. But by the time I hit my mid-30s, I had tipped the scales around 225 pounds and all of that 75 pound weight gain was pure body fat. And with that body fat came high blood pressure as well as type 2 diabetes. And it wasn't just my physical health that was suffering from these bad choices either. My mental health was taking a hit as well. It's really hard to get motivated to do things when you're out of shape and tired all of the time. Even though I hated my job and where I was in life, I just kept doing it because it was more convenient to stay where I was than it was to step outside of my comfort zone and try something new. And when you're in that unhealthy depressed mindset, it's really hard to see the actual problem that's causing all of your misery. I remember my doctor telling me, you just need to start moving a little more. Try going for a short walk every day. So I took his advice and I gave it a try. It would be an understatement to say that it didn't work out very well. The very first day that I made an attempt to go for a walk, I sat on my couch in front of my TV and rationalized what I was about to do. I'm about to get off of this comfortable couch, turn off the TV, and then go walk for two miles just so that I can get back to this comfortable couch and continue watching TV. And sure enough, the convenience addicted side of my personality chimed in and said, if you're already sitting on the couch watching TV and your goal is to get back to the couch to watch TV, then why the hell are you even going for a walk in the first place? You're already here. You see, I was focused on the destination, not the journey. And because there was no delayed gratification of the destination, meaning that I really didn't need to do anything to sit and watch TV, I was already doing it. There was no anticipation of the event to motivate me to push through the walk itself. This convenience-based mindset kept me unhealthy for quite a few years. Then one fall morning, something happened. I decided to actually take a walk. And if I'm being totally honest, it was probably because there wasn't anything that I wanted to watch on TV at the time. But the why doesn't matter in this situation. All that matters is, is I took a walk. Now there are three scents that I am addicted to in nature. The smell of burning wood, the smell of fresh cut grass, and the smell of blooming lilac flowers. The aromas of those three things are like an aphrodisiac to me. And on this particular day, it was kind of cold outside. So along my walk, I passed about four houses that were burning wood in their fireplaces. And that smell of burning logs was bellowing from their chimneys. That sensory experience alone made the two mile walk seem to go by in an instant. But like most people, whenever I smell certain things, it triggers vivid memories from my past. For me, the scent of burning wood reminds me of campfires as a kid, roasting marshmallows with the first girl I ever had a crush on, as well as just hanging out with my friends on the beach as an adult. And the strange thing was, that sensory experience was so strong that I actually found myself anticipating my next walk, just so I could experience that memory rush one more time. And that went on, day after day after day. For the first time, I was no longer focused on the destination, getting back home in front of the television. I was looking forward to the journey. And that continued on throughout the entire fall and all of the winter months. When spring and summer rolled around, people were no longer using their fireplaces, but they were starting to cut their grass and the flowers were also starting to bloom. So I started changing up my walking route a little. I tried to find houses that had lilac bushes planted out front of them. I even started paying attention to when certain homeowners would cut their grass each week so that I could make it a point to walk past those houses on the day that they did it. The dopamine hit that smelling all of those aromas triggered in my brain had become addictive. And as a result, I started finding myself walking further and further each day. My once two mile daily walk turned into a five mile daily walk. And the more I walked every day, the more I began to notice physical changes to my body. A lot of the aches and pains that I had previously had in my joints were starting to go away and my energy levels were starting to go through the roof. But I think the most noticeable impact that my walking had on my body was the fact that I went from being 225 pounds to a much healthier 150 pounds in just about a year and a half. And that weight loss also led me to start eating healthier. It eventually got to the point where if I didn't walk on a particular day, I felt like crap all day. All of those positive body changes, coupled with the sensory stimulation that I was getting from those different scents throughout the year, were making me anticipate the walk every day. My daily walks had nothing to do with me getting to any particular destination. 
I was walking solely because I loved the journey. That was over 15 years ago, and because I loved and anticipated that journey every day, I stuck with it, and I still do it to this very day. That walk is now as much part of my daily ritual as brushing my teeth every morning. And it was that lesson that taught me the importance of enjoying the journey. So I began to apply that same principle to other areas of my life. For years I had worked at jobs I absolutely hated. I only stayed with them out of convenience. They paid me enough money to be able to afford a decent living, and they didn't require me to step out of my comfort zone and try something new. You see, I liked coming home every night to watch TV or to hang out with my friends. And the fact that I could have most of my weekends off was the reason that I was willing to give up 40 to 50 hours every week to do a job that I hated. For years, I focused solely on the destination, relaxing at home and hanging out with my friends on the weekends, and completely ignored the fact that I was sacrificing 30% of my daily life doing something that made me miserable. Thankfully, fate intervened one day when the company that I was working for decided to pack up and move the operation to Mexico. Now for most people, that would have been a bad thing, but for me, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. After I had been let go, I started thinking about what I was going to do next. And as I did that, all of those lessons I had learned about anticipating the journey every day encouraged me to step outside of my comfort zone and to try something new. So I went back to college to study 3D animation, and I loved it. This was the first time in my life that I was actually excited to go to school every day. In every hour of every class I took, I was learning something new, something that was blowing my mind creatively, and I just wanted more. Now I was easily the oldest person in my class by at least 15 years. For most of the students, it was more like 30 years. But my enthusiasm for that subject matter was so obvious that one of my art teachers ended up recommending me for an internship with the research department of the college I was attending. That meant that before I even graduated, I was already getting paid to do 3D animation, something that I truly loved doing. And when I did finally graduate, they kept me on full time for another two years. Never in my life was I more eager to go to work every day than I was during those two years. Every day I was surrounded by like-minded creative people and that was something that I had never experienced before. In fact, I loved that work so much I began taking on additional jobs on the side. That led me to eventually starting my own little 3D animation company and I kept that company running successfully for over a decade. And during that 10 years, I was even asked by the college to come back and teach 3D animation in the same program I had graduated from. So not only was I doing something that I loved every day, but I was also getting to share it with other people. For the first time in my life, I wasn't working to reach a destination. I was working because I loved the journey. I took back those 40 to 50 hours a week that I had been sacrificing for so many years and turned them into part of my life that I looked forward to every day. Then, one day it all came to a crashing halt because of a health problem. Now I'm not going to go into all of the details, but if you're interested in learning more, check out my speed doodle video on why I started my YouTube channel. I go into a little more detail in that video. I'll put a link to that video at the end of this one. But the long and short of it was, I had to shut down my company, stop teaching, and walk away from 3D animation altogether. And that was probably one of the hardest periods of my life. For the first year after that, I didn't focus on anything other than trying to get my health back. But after that first year, I had to decide what I was going to do to make a living. And the only thing I was sure of was that I could never go back to working for the destination. If I wasn't going to enjoy the journey, I wasn't going to do it. Once you've experienced living your life on your own terms and doing things because you want to do them, you'll be hooked for life. There's nothing else like it. And that's how this whole YouTube journey started for me. I've loved doodling since I was a child, so I knew that I wouldn't have any problem doing that every day. And from my time at college, I had really developed a passion for teaching. And because I had been working in 3D animation for over a decade, I was fairly familiar with video editing. So deciding to take this YouTube journey just seemed like a no-brainer. Now I'm about a year and eight months into this journey as of this video, and I am loving it. Although I do have a general idea of which direction I would like this channel to go over the next few years, I've yet to decide on a clear and defined destination that I want it to arrive at in the future. And to be honest, I don't think I ever will. I'm living this YouTube journey one week at a time. Every video that I create is being made in an effort to make this channel more valuable and informative to you, the viewer. 
Every digital product that I create is designed as a tool to make your creative journey easier. Every drawing I draw will be part of an upcoming product, whether it's a coloring book, a children's storybook, or a piece of apparel that I'll be selling in my YouTube store. Everything you see me do on this channel is being done with a purpose. Where this channel will end up in 10 years, your guess is as good as mine. But if I'm being honest, I don't really care because I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. And based on the comments section of my videos, many of you seem to be enjoying what I'm doing as well. So as long as you keep watching my videos, I'll keep creating new ones for you. And who knows, maybe one day I will arrive at a final destination. But until that time, I'm just going to keep on loving the journey that I'm on. And you should too. Alright, I think that's about enough talking for this video. If you enjoyed this video and you want me to create more just like it, then be sure to give this video a like. Your liking and commenting on my videos lets the YouTube algorithm know that you think that the video should be shared with others. And that really does help my channel grow. So if you've been doing that on my videos, then thank you. Okay, now I'll shut up and let you enjoy the rest of this doodle in peace. Okay, so hopefully this video in some small way will not only help you to learn to love the journey that you're on, but will also help you to obsess a little bit less about reaching that final destination. Now just a heads up, I'm going to be starting a new playlist in the very near future called Doodle With Me, where I'll be posting videos showing my entire doodling process in real time. And not just the drawing, I'll be including the painting as well. Now these won't be full page doodles like the one you just watched, they'll be much smaller. That way, if you have your own drawing tablet and access to Adobe Illustrator, you can draw along with me. But until that time, if you'd like to check out more of my Speed Doodle vlogs, you can find a link to that playlist right here. Until next time, take care.